Hello everybody. Today on cars you may have forgot even existed, but you can actually still buy, I give you the Toyota Supra Mark V, also known as the A90. In the last few years, the Mark IV Supra has attained mythic status, with prices to match. In fact, a good example of a Supra is often more expensive than the equivalent Ferrari or Porsche of the day. And the buzz around the launch of this car was like very few others I've seen in recent years. However, it's fair to say that when this car was finally released, more than a few people were left just a little bit disappointed, because this car was not only co-developed with, but also built by BMW. Now that's not automatically a bad thing, it doesn't make it a bad car, but it doesn't make it a Toyota either. This car shares a production line in Austria with its Bavarian sibling, the BMW Z4. However, Toyota are keen to point out that their influence may not be so obvious because it came from very early on in the program's inception. They say that it was their idea that this should have the golden ratio of wheelbase to track of 1.55 that gives you optimum sporty handling. It's also very rigid. In fact, despite being made from aluminium, this is stiffer even than the Lexus LFA. Up front, you'll find an engine that seems like a perfect fit for a Supra. It's a three litre straight six with a twin scroll turbocharger, making 335 horsepower and a very healthy 369 pound foot of torque. That's about 500 Newton meters. However, this is a BMW B58, more or less the exact same engine as you'd find in an M140i. But yet again, Toyota say this is not by accident. This is because they had a hand in this engine's design from its very inception. They saw BMW's straight sixes and thought, yes, that's the perfect engine. However, the N55 was seen as just a little bit too unreliable for the Japanese. So they worked with BMW and made sure that this was built to not just German, but Japanese standards. That's why it has a closed deck block. And to be honest, it seems to have worked because the B58 has become a very, very reliable engine and something of a tuner's favorite. So once again, I think actually this is acceptable. In many ways, this car I think is closer in spirit to the Mark IV Supra than people give it credit for. After all, that car also had an engine that wasn't particularly keen on revs, but had plenty of low down grunt and mid-range power. That also sold in large numbers with automatic gearboxes, here the only option with the three litre, and the car's reputation really came from the tuning scene, and Toyota have certainly not forgotten them. To give you an example, all these fake vents all over the car, well, they've been designed explicitly that when you start pushing the car's power, you can open them up and they'll actually work. Inside, you'll find a steering wheel with a rim that's just a little bit thinner than the one BMW use. The center of gravity is lower even than a GT86, despite having a straight six and not a flat four. The engine bay is also deliberately big enough to be able to fit a 2JZ in, and the engine as it comes has power figures that some suspect are just a little bit modest. However, the BMW influence does also shine through quite clearly. That interior, thin rimmed wheel aside, is pure BMW parts bin, and not even the latest parts either. The suspension at the front is McPherson strut, typical BMW and not the superior double wishbone that Toyota are known to favor. Also, the proportions are just all wrong. This is clearly inspired by the FT1 concept car and that looked absolutely gorgeous. This has many of the same lines but the problem is the proportions are just wrong. Because this is built on a Z4 chassis it has to be broadly Z4 shaped. It's too narrow, it's too tall, it just looks a bit off. This bonnet sits impossibly high and from inside you feel like you're looking through a letterbox. We can quibble all day long as to how much of a real Toyota this actually is, but to tell you the truth, I don't very much care. All I'm interested in is whether it's actually any good to drive. And until today, I've never even sat in one of these. This particular example is what they call the Yorama Racetrack Edition, named for the circuit where the car was launched. It is a plaques and paint special. There's no extra performance goodies on it. It's got this beautiful horizon blue paintwork, these nice 19 inch alloy wheels, and some blue detailing inside. That's it. So then, let's take this out and find out whether it's really worthy of the Supra name. It would appear that we are currently living in very, 
very strange times. In many ways, this seems like a sort of second golden age for the Japanese car. However, things I don't think are playing out quite how the manufacturers expected. After all, who would have thought that Toyota would have at long last brought out the new Mark V Supra only to have it totally trumped by a Yaris. Likewise, Honda now are just about to throw in the towel on the NSX. And the sad fact is that here in Europe, almost nobody noticed and they actually stopped selling it two years ago. Meanwhile, a Civic Type R, you're currently gonna pay a 10 to 15,000 pound premium to get. Nuts, right? I've been living with this car for a week now. Not unusual for a press car, but I've left it until the day before collection so that I can give the most honest and detailed appraisal possible. And to be completely straight with you all, the fifth gen Supra is a bit of a mess. In truth, bad cars aren't something that really exist anymore. It's actually pretty difficult to make a genuinely bad vehicle anymore. And the Supra is far from bad. In fact, it has many excellent redeeming qualities. It is ludicrously fast. This engine and gearbox are absolutely sensational. But that's no real surprise, is it? The BMW B58 pairs with the ZF 8-speed like sausages and particularly decent mash. The engine is incredible. It responds so quickly, so violently. It has real savage punch from low down. And although it doesn't rev that high, red line here is about 6,500 RPM, it will pull strong the whole time. The gearbox also, when you want it to be nice and smooth, it is. But when you want to change, it will shift all almost like a dual clutch. In fact, really, it shifts as quick as a dual clutch, but seems to be missing just a, a little bit of that kind of drama, that kick that you get from some of the later dual clutches. I have even averaged over 35 to the gallon for long periods of time while I've had this car. That's absolutely incredible. Even the looks have actually grown on me over time. And at 55,000 pounds, if you don't need the space, this makes an excellent alternative, I think, to a BMW M2. If you made me choose, I'd certainly have the Toyota over that car. However, there are a number of failings in this car. Some rather small, some more significant, and it all feels a little bit un-Toyota, if I'm honest. And I would say over the last week, all of these little things have added up to create an experience that was some way short of the expectations I had for this car. It didn't really get off to a good start when I smashed my skull, squeezing myself through this porthole that Toyota call a door. Then, having spent quite a bit of time recently in a Porsche 944, I was absolutely shocked by the driving position and the visibility. The dash feels like it's somewhere up there. The windscreen is impossibly small, steeply raked, so it feels like you are somewhat imprisoned in this thing. Out the back, you've got a fairly small, although acceptable view. And over here, actually, is, is not so bad. There, forget about it. I'm also somewhat perplexed by the choice of calling this the Yarama Racetrack Edition. You have this horizon blue paintwork that I really like, even if it is suspiciously similar to BMW's Mizano Blue that you'll have certainly seen on the Z4. These great big wing mirrors are, I suppose, somewhat necessary to compensate for the poor visibility, but they're very Germanic in their styling, don't seem to fit with the rest of the car. I've got to say, over the time I've had it, the looks of the thing have actually grown on me to the point where I now say it's not a bad looking car. The proportions are still wrong. If this was six inches wider and about two inches lower, it would be sensational. But as it is, it just doesn't quite work. The interior also has been the source of quite a few of my frustrations because, yes, it's a BMW interior, but I assumed this would simply be the Z4's interior with Toyota badges because that's what everyone said that it is. It's actually not. It is an interior made up of different BMW bits, but BMW bits from a different era and different cars. So this doesn't have, to give you an example, Android Auto. The Toyota Corolla Hybrid that I had before this car, which costs almost half as much, does. And you have to wonder, if you're gonna go and pilfer a totally different BMW parts bin to what you would get in a Z4, why couldn't you have just put 
Toyota bits in here. They're perfectly good enough. They're very nice. And look, it's not a bad interior. In fact, it's very nicely made. The materials are quite nice. And for your 55 grand, it feels rather premium. I like the thinner rim steering wheel. It's a very nice piece of attention to detail. And yeah, it all works because it's basically iDrive and iDrive is very good. But lacking stuff like Android Auto is just baffling, really, truly baffling. This dash in front of you in particular, if the sun's low, is actually almost impossible to read, which is not helpful. And I'm very disappointed that although this is a limited edition, normally those you think would have more toys than usual, but this doesn't even have the heads-up display you got on the A90 Supra Pro. That's a shame. The ride at low speeds is also just a bit choppier than it really needs to be. However, it's not all bad for the Supra, as I will now demonstrate. The thing feels ruddy fast, and it's certainly got plenty of grip. That mechanical limited slip differential gives you a real confidence, and you can push on maybe a little bit more than you know is wise, and the car always seems to have you. Traction control doesn't intervene, or if it does, it does so in a very, very seamless way. I'm impressed with it. But there is a bit of an issue, and in some ways, maybe it's not a problem. You see, this car will throw you into the seat. You'll work your way through the gears and you're almost convinced that you must be doing the thick end of a ton. You then look down and find out you're actually doing about 70. Because it's geared so short, it's just a little bit disappointing in some ways. It does make a reasonable sound though. It's not quite BMW 6. Toyota must have done something. This doesn't sound like a B58 to me. What does take quite some time to get used to, and I'm not sure that I have, is the steering. This has a turn in not unlike a Ferrari F12, and that's not an especially good thing. This is ludicrously sensitive. I mean, the amount of steering input you need to turn is absolutely minuscule. This feels like a slightly overweight Ginetta. It's exacerbated, I'm sure, by the fact you are sat essentially over the rear axle, so everything is just that much more dramatic. But the first few miles in this car are not particularly easy or comfortable ones. It feels very, very unnecessary, the steering. And the worst bit is that it doesn't really have any feel. So in normal mode, it's super darty, agile, has no feedback. Then in sport mode, it's super darty, agile, has no feedback, but is really heavy. I can't help but wonder if the choice of McPherson strut at the front, and that has to be a BMW decision, has really knackered this car a little bit. I wonder if it had double wishbones, it wouldn't just be a little bit better behaved. Our stiffer setups tend to be cars which are made as more track orientated things, but even there, there is a problem. Robert Mitchell at Apex Nürburgring had a lot of issues with their Toyota because it had some pretty awful bump steer. Now I must say, on the road, I haven't really experienced this. The way he drives a car is going to be very different to the way that I, or most other people, will drive on the road. So I've not experienced that, but if you do want to drive your car on track, it's almost certainly going to be something you'll have to deal with. some more nice things. Storage space is actually okay. The car itself is also very small, although because that bonnet line is so high and the corners drop away, it is somewhat difficult to place. Despite the fact it is relatively compact, it feels like you're really taking up all of the road. When you're on it, I would always suggest that you put this car in manual mode for a couple of reasons. First off, it's actually very nice, really responsive, and these paddles, although they're not particularly fancy, do the job well. Also, if you do leave the car in sport and drive, all it wants to do is just sit there at 4,000 RPM, and that gets quite tiring. And there's really no need for it, because this engine has incredible punch from very low down. Let me give you a demonstration. So I'm in fifth gear now at 
turn off 1000 RPM, foot down, and we're off. And if you're revving a little bit more, the delay is even shorter. I moan about turbo lag in a lot of cars, but this really is up there with some of the best. Once you get it spinning, this thing's sensational, and it can put its power down no trouble at all. One of the stranger failings of this car is the seats, because I feel like I'm very much perched on them. They've got lots and lots of adjustment in them, but they feel like they're about an inch too narrow, at least. If you adjust the bolsters on these, they're very odd because it doesn't feel like it's actually gripping me, it feels like it's trying to just push me out of the seat. The seat base also feels like it's far, far too small, so I'm sat more or less on the right side bolster. And after a long journey, I can get just a little bit tiring. Got a bit of a two series feel about it almost. The pedals are fairly light, the brakes not too heavily servoed. I maybe like them just a, a little bit less assisted, but they're not awful. Because of the design of the cabin, you do get a fair amount of road noise in here, but it's not as bad as some other cars I've experienced, so that's not really a negative point, more an observation. Perhaps my biggest gripe with this car, certainly as a daily driver, and I know this is odd, is the stereo. Now, when I got in this car, I noticed the fact that behind your head there are two fairly large, meaty-looking subwoofers. Then in the door, you've got two speakers as well. Because this is a tiny cabin, it should be really, really easy to get some banging sounds in this car. But it's actually mediocre at best. And that's just unforgivable. I mean, how can you have big subs behind your head and have a system which is not very bassy at all? Even with the bass turned all the way up, it was okay. I'm sure there is an upgraded stereo, but really, it should be better as standard. Honestly, there's no excuse for poor sound in a cabin this small and a car this expensive, especially when you haven't even put Android Auto in it. I did Google about that, and it turns out that people argued, and some said actually you were going to get Android Auto for the 2021 Supra, so maybe it's coming soon, but really, why wasn't it there from day one, Toyota? Toyota over the last few years have very, very much confused me because they're clearly on a drive to try and re-establish themselves, not just as a dominant brand, but also a brand which makes cars for driving enthusiasts. Their chair, Accio Toyota, is a real proper petrol head and probably one of the few people in the world in a position to actually make sure that we keep getting cars that we enjoy. Here's what I really don't get. Toyota decided to partner with BMW on this project and the reasoning cited was the fact that if you're going to try and develop a car like this without some help, the numbers just weren't going to add up. And you know what? I can accept that. That's fine. They partnered with Subaru for the GT86, and I think generally that worked quite well. Yes, it was a somewhat flawed car, but still very much, obviously, a Toyota or a heavily Toyota-influenced car. But with this, engine and gearbox aside, and the gearbox isn't really even BMW, I have absolutely no idea why you'd have chosen that company to partner with. Let's be honest here, if you're gonna get one of the other kids at school to do your homework, you want one of the smart kids that's really good in that subject, don't you? I mean, you wouldn't get me to do your PE homework, would you? Come on. BMW have a very, very poor record when it comes to sports cars. I don't believe, to date, they've actually made one that was successful. And the problem with this car is that as much as Toyota might try and say to me, no, 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 we had a real hand in this, we've influenced so many things, I honestly don't really care what the car actually is. I care what it feels like, and it doesn't feel to me like a Toyota. Simply put, it's not good enough. Dynamically, it's compromised, it's fidgety, but it's not feelsome. Yes, it feels quite quick, and I'm sure you can tune the bejesus out of it, and I'm sure many of you would say, but James, this is a car that, yes, sure, has many faults. The idea is you've got to make it into your perfect car. Well, yeah, all right, that, that's all well and good, but most of these things would be sold on a higher purchase or PCP agreement, which means you can't really modify them that much. So you need the base thing to be pretty good. At the core of this car has always been a debate as to how much it really is. 
a Toyota. And that debate will go on for a very long time. But to me, one thing is absolutely certain. This, in my mind, is not a Supra. Now, I'd be usually one of the first people to tell the naysayers, well, sorry, chappy, it is a Supra. That's what the badge on the back says. However, history tells me that a Supra, almost without fail, is a front-engined, six-cylinder, often turbocharged, rear-wheel drive car, but with two plus two seating and often more of a GT bent rather than a sports car vibe. This is a strict two-seater sports car. It's actually also a lot cheaper than the old Supra was. There is though another sports car from the recent past which had a very cool swoopy looking design, a short wheelbase, fidgety handling, a double bubble roof, a six-cylinder engine and was something of a missed opportunity. That was the BMW Z4 M Coupe and I can't help but feel that Toyota have been a little bit conned here and BMW have managed to get them to pay for a second Z4 Coupe because that is precisely what this feels like. Like I said at the beginning, there are really no truly bad cars anymore. I'm sure they still exist, but they are very, very rare. Instead, what you find are cars that simply missed expectation. And this is probably one of the biggest examples of that I can think. With the GI Yaris, Toyota swung pretty hard, and it was well worth it. They hit a hell of a home run. But with this, they tried to play it, I think, a bit safe, and it backfired. this car is one of those they often give out to the press when it's about a year away from being finished and you go yeah that's not quite right that's not quite right that's not quite right that's not quite right but then nine months later all of a sudden everything just comes together and it really just works this doesn't in terms of missed hits this is like a, a clip of someone trying to hit a baseball and swinging accidentally knocking themselves on the floor falling onto a landmine exploding and then having their entrails land in a sort of compromising and slightly funny way i'm sure there are plenty of people out there for whom this would still be an excellent purchase it is quick it is tunable it looks distinctive it's quite rare and when it wants to be it is actually a lot of fun to drive but for me it's just not the complete package if i was going to spend about fifty thousand pounds on a coupe i'd probably find a lightly used jaguar f type r or if you want to be brave an aston martin v8 vantage then you've got a proper badge no bmw bits in there i think All hope is certainly not lost for Toyota. They clearly can still get it right. And if reports are to be believed from America, the new GR86 could be the car that we've all been waiting for. It may not have the punch and the potency of the Supra, but I think it might just have that interaction and feedback that I really want in my sports cars. So, there we have it. That's enough from me, I think. As always, thank you for watching. Please like, comment down below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and I shall see you for the next one. Bye-bye.